Europe, Austria, the village of Capron, November the 11th, 2000. Thousands of skiers and snowboarders crowd into the resort for the opening day of the winter sports season. What makes Capron so popular is its giant glacier, the Kitzsteinhorn. It's a mountain of ice that never melts, whatever the weather, making skiing possible even in summer. A high-tech ski train rises 1,500 meters through solid rock to land skiers near the summit. Next to the upper station, a restaurant and shopping mall. Eight forty-five a.m. Skiers and snowboarders celebrate the season's start. People light firecrackers. Torsten Gradler, part-time firefighter from Germany, arrives for the big day with forty-nine members of his ski club. That particular trip was the first outing of the year two thousand. Thomas Kraus has just joined the club. He's looking forward to his first glimpse of the glacier. To reach the slopes, skiers have a choice, a standard cable car or a high-tech train called a funicular. Most of the group headed for the funicular. I thought to myself, that's bound to be fast. He joins 29 other club members lining up for the high-speed summit train. The 3.8 kilometer ride should take just nine minutes, four minutes faster than the cable car. 8.57 a.m. 161 passengers crowd on board, among them some of the world's top skiers. Sandra Schmidt holds an Olympic gold for Germany. And Sebastian Geiger, who's just 14, is junior champion. Today, there's an entire American family on board, too. U.S. Army Major Michael Goodridge, his wife Jennifer, and their sons, five-year-old Kyle and seven-year-old Michael. A longtime member of Torsten's club, Manfred Hiltel thinks nothing of taking the train. I've been skiing for decades and regularly travel in cable cars, chairs, lifts or funiculars. I didn't give it a second thought. Nine oh two AM. Control room staff keep tabs as the train pulls out of the valley station. First it crosses a spectacular six hundred meter ravine before entering a steep tunnel that climbs through the mountain. For the passengers on board, the upper valley with its ideal skiing conditions should now be just nine minutes away. But today will be different. The train first opened its doors in 1974. It was an engineering triumph, the first of its kind. An underground train inside a mountain climbing at speeds of 25 kilometers per hour up a steep 30 degree incline. In 1993, it was modernized, giving it a sleek futuristic look and making it the pride of Austria's ski resorts. The system is ingenious but simple. There are two trains, each one balancing the other. As one climbs, its twin across the tunnel descends. At the top station, a powerful electric motor and pulley system pulls the trains up and down the track. Neither train has an engine or fuel. There are no drivers, just an attendant at the front of the train who operates the doors. Each train has two coaches with eight separate passenger compartments. There's a cab at the front and the rear of the train for the attendant who switches back and forth as the train travels up and down. It can carry up to 180 passengers. Every day, more than a thousand people use the train and it enjoys a perfect safety record. Until now. 9.02 and three seconds. 
The 161 passengers are spread through the train. Thomas Krauss is in the last compartment. Just 20 meters out of the station, he spots something. The first unusual thing I noticed was the smoke. It was like a cigarette that you put down for a moment. Thomas is at the back of the train near the empty attendant cab, which is only used for the downhill trip. Smoke from the cab starts to seep into the rest of the car. Passengers grow concerned, then agitated. There are no smoke alarms to alert either the train attendant or the control room. One passenger tries to make a call for help on a cell phone. Others bang on the rear wall of the coach. But no one hears them. Nine o four a.m. The train enters the tunnel, cutting off cell phone signals. And there's no way to contact the attendant at the front of the train. He's more than 50 meters away, totally unaware of the crisis unfolding in the rear compartment. You could already see fire flickering, licking upwards. The word got round, and people inside the compartment realized that there was a real problem. Nine oh five. Six hundred meters into the dark tunnel, the train suddenly stops. The control room contacts the attendant to find out what's going on, but he has no idea. He didn't halt the train. Nine oh five and thirty seconds. The rear coach is now filling with toxic smoke. But there's no emergency door release. The 161 passengers are trapped. Nine oh six a.m. As the blaze in the empty attendance cab worsens, toxic smoke fills the passenger compartments. Torsten Gradler is one of the skiers trapped in the blazing rear coach. The man next to me, who is also a member of our ski group, tried to pull the door open by grasping the rubber seal. But the doors won't open, and some people are starting to panic. Torsten and another man try to smash the windows with a ski pole. But they're made of shockproof plexiglass. It was very, very difficult. He had to use extreme force just to make a hole. At last, they break the window and think they're free. Only to find another pane of glass behind it. Then suddenly, the dangerous situation turns desperate. Flames from the empty attendant's cab burst into the compartment. The terrified passengers have nowhere to go. Nine oh eight. Up until now, the attendant at the front of the train hasn't seen the blaze. Now he realizes what's going on. He alerts the control room. They tell him open the doors and get the people out. At that exact moment, the intercom dies and all contact with the burning train is lost. Operators in the control room have no idea what's going on deep within the mountain tunnel. Meanwhile, Torsten Gradler's efforts to smash the windows pay off. And he and the other passengers dive out of the train. I was the last one to leave the compartment. By that time, flames were all around my head. But in other compartments, passengers are still trapped. Some people just stood there, not moving at all. They appeared to have been overcome by the smoke and paralyzed by it. Nine oh nine. 
9.11 a.m. At the station, an operator in the control room calls for help. For those few who've managed to escape the stricken train, the nightmare continues. They must find a way out in the smoke-filled darkness. They face a life-or-death decision. Which way to go? Up, away from the fire. Or back down, past the fire. Torsten Gradler has been a volunteer fireman in his hometown for 25 years. His instinct tells him to head down. The emergency stairs run right through the tunnel to the exit 600 meters away. But first, he has to clamber across the rails wearing ski boots. The ski boot on my right foot got stuck in the rails, and I just couldn't wrench my right leg free. Fellow ski club member Thomas Kraus is already on the staircase. He sees his friend trapped on the track, surrounded by the flames. I gave him a hand, and the two of us ran past the train. With his ski boot now free, Torsten tells Thomas, Manfred and others to climb downwards. But the emergency steps are narrow and very steep, and they're slowed down by their bulky ski gear, making progress agonizingly slow. It was dark. I stumbled because I couldn't get into a rhythm. My ski boots were like plaster casts. Running downhill in them was extremely difficult. Under Torsten's guidance, the desperate group tries to stay together. Above them looms the burning train. Its cables could snap at any moment, sending the 40-ton train roaring down the tunnel towards them. At last, the 12 skiers emerge into the daylight. They're exhausted and terrified, but alive. Nine twenty-three. One hundred and forty-nine passengers and the train attendant are still stranded inside the blazing tunnel. Rescue workers pour in. Five hundred firefighters, twenty-two helicopters, one hundred rescue vehicles rush to the scene. But the lower end of the tunnel the train is nearest to is way up the mountainside. The only way for firefighters to reach it is on foot up the railway. What they encounter is terrifying. The train is ablaze from end to end. In such extremes of heat, the cable it hangs from could snap at any moment, sending the train hurtling down on top of them and crashing into the valley station below. 9.35. 30 minutes after the fire began, the firemen are forced to abandon the rescue attempt. There's been a total electricity failure. The power supply goes out all over the mountain. Staff at the station fight to restore the electricity. But the station is filling with thick, toxic smoke and they're forced to escape through an emergency door. Without power, the door jams open. Now fumes escape into the summit station shopping mall full of people. Employees evacuate the station and shopping area. Dozens of people escape, but there are still four more trapped inside. Helicopters airlift the first teams of rescuers up to the summit. Firefighters gear up to enter the smoke-filled building. 1016. Friedrich's team enters the shopping area in search of survivors. You couldn't see anything at all. That's how it was. It was like walking into a void. Thank God we chose the right-hand entrance and quickly found the first person. The firefighters stumble upon a workman lying unconscious just inside the main entrance. He's barely breathing. They rush him outside just in time. 
They plunge into the smoke-filled building again. Despite zero visibility, they find the last three people. Tragically, they're already dead. The thick smoke and high temperatures make it too dangerous for the firefighters to continue into the station and tunnel. The search for the missing 149 passengers is suspended. For Fire Chief Andon Brandauer, it's an agonizing dilemma. We were there with nearly 500 men and 60 or 70 fire engines, but there was still nothing that we could do. Twelve midday. Three terrible hours since the inferno started. It's still dangerous, but Fire Chief Brandar decides to let two small teams of specially equipped rescuers enter the tunnel in search of survivors. The men have no idea what to expect in the smoke-filled darkness. One team reaches the sister train, which was heading down the valley at the time of the blaze. Inside, they find the bodies of the attendant and his only passenger. Further down the tunnel, rescuers arrive at the burned-out train. Around it, the track is completely destroyed, rails torn and twisted. Then they make an awful discovery. Of the 149 passengers trapped in the train, not one has survived. What was to have been a great day skiing has turned into a day of unimaginable tragedy. In total, 155 people are dead. Only 12 incredibly lucky survivors escaped the fire. It's the worst peacetime tragedy Austria has ever suffered and devastating news for dozens of bereaved families around the world. That's the worst part of it, telling the relatives there are no survivors. For me, that was the worst moment. Most of the bodies are burnt beyond recognition. In some cases, identification relies on DNA cross-matched with samples from the victims' toothbrushes and razors found in their hotels. Among those who die are U.S. Army Major Michael Goodridge, his wife Jennifer, and their two young children. World freestyle skiing champion Sandra Schmidt perishes along with her parents. German junior ski champion Sebastian Geiger, aged 14, dies with three other members of his group and their two ski coaches. But how could this terrible tragedy happen? It's a total mystery. Pulled up by a cable and winch, the train has no engine, no fuel tanks, and only low voltage electrical devices. What could have caused the blaze? The regional public prosecutor's office orders an investigation into the cause of the disaster. They appoint Helmut Prada to head the inquiry and recruit a team of 12 to solve the mystery. Using their findings, we can piece together the deadly chain of events. Forensic investigators begin by searching for clues to the source of the blaze. They must work on the burnt out train inside the tunnel. If the wreck is moved, they may lose vital clues. They haul the sister train, untouched by the flames, out of the tunnel for analysis. Built to identical specifications, the twin train may reveal an undetected design flaw. Within hours of the tragedy, journalists air theories on the cause of the fire. The Times of London suggests that snowboarders may have been to blame. The paper reports that some snowboarders may have been lighting firecrackers in celebration of the opening day of the new winter sports season. Could a teenage prank have started the terrifying inferno which would go on to claim 155 lives? At this early stage of the inquiry, nothing is ruled out. Investigators take survivor Thomas Krauss to the sister train to point out where he first saw the blaze. 
In my statement, I said it was like a cigarette that you put down for a moment. That's what it looked like, the smoke coming from the control panel. The control panel is in the rear attendance compartment. Investigators try to find out if anyone could have got in there and started a fire, accidentally or even deliberately. But the rear cab is sealed off from the passenger compartment. The only way into it is from the platform. Eyewitnesses confirm it was empty on the fateful journey. The attendant was in the uphill cab at the front of the train. The only opportunity for someone to enter the rear cab and start a fire is during the train's three-minute stop at the valley station just before it leaves. Investigators calculate that this is too short a time frame for anyone to get in, start the fire and get out without being noticed. They dismiss theories that a snowboarder or anyone else started the blaze. Still, they concentrate on the rear guard's cab. Something in there did cause the deadly blaze. But what? Passenger Thomas Krauss has told them where the fire broke out. The control panel in the rear attendance compartment, which contains electrical wiring. Painstakingly, the team carry out tests to see if faulty wiring could have sparked the blaze. But the cables which were replaced during the train's modernization in 1993 are all coated with self-extinguishing materials and could not sustain a fire. It seems the train's modernized electrical system conforms to all fire safety standards. Still, the team continues to explore the records of the train's 1993 refit. Then, they make a fascinating discovery. During the train's modernization, the attendant's cabs were made more comfortable. Electric fan heaters were installed to keep the cabs warm during the freezing winter months when temperatures can plummet to minus 20 degrees Celsius. and they're located beneath the control panels where smoke was first spotted. When investigators check out the manufacturer's instructions for the heaters, they uncover a terrible oversight. Incredibly, they find the train's heater is designed for use in the home, not for moving vehicles. Could fitting a domestic heater to a mountain train somehow have caused the blaze? They turn to the identical heater in the sister train and make a stunning discovery. The mount for the heating element has broken, meaning it can easily get jammed against its plastic casing and catch fire. Further tests show that four out of five heaters of this type have the same defect. It's a major breakthrough for the team but it doesn't close the case. By itself, a faulty fan heater could possibly start a fire. But with no fuel on board, how could it grow into an inferno so ferocious that the train's aluminium body melted and its steel rails buckled? Investigators are baffled. But then one of the team stumbles on a pool of oily liquid on the track. The trail leads upwards to the tunnel's entrance. They send it to a forensic lab for analysis. Results show that it's hydraulic oil, just like the oil used in the train's braking system. And it's highly flammable. Professor Joseph Nejes is an expert on this type of railway. There is no other explanation than that this hydraulic oil originated from the damaged train itself. Just like the new heaters in the attendance cabs, the hydraulic system was a new feature installed during the 1993 refit. 
120 liters of the flammable hydraulic oil run in pipes along the 61 meter train. But how did the oil escape onto the track? Hydraulic pipes are often not completely leak-proof, so a small amount of hydraulic oil may have seeped out. But how did the highly flammable oil come into contact with the faulty fan heater? After all, they should be in two completely different places on the train. Investigators comb the sister train for clues and make another crucial discovery. The control panel in the guard's compartment houses an hydraulic pressure gauge and oil pipes leading to the gauge pass within just a few centimeters of the faulty heater. If these pipes were leaking, some of the flammable oil could have dripped onto the heater. Could this be the vital breakthrough investigators are looking for? Now they can piece together the chain of events leading up to the tragedy. Fourteen minutes before disaster. The train fills up with 161 skiers. In the empty attendance cab, a dribble of oil is already dripping down the pipes into the heater, which comes on automatically during station stops. A design fault causes the unit to overheat. Hydraulic oil seeps onto the red-hot heater element. Fire breaks out unnoticed before the train even leaves the station. Nine minutes to go. As the train pulls out of the station, the heater switches off automatically. But it's too late. Inside, fire takes hold. Thomas Krauss is close by the control panel. The first unusual thing I noticed was the smoke. Wisps of smoke coming from some sort of control panel. Seven minutes. As the train approaches the tunnel, flames from the heater melt the leaking pipes. Now oil gushes out of the pipes, soaking the plastic floor and dripping onto the track below. As the train enters the tunnel, highly flammable hydraulic oil is feeding a roaring blaze. Six minutes left. 600 meters into the tunnel, the train unexpectedly comes to a stop. The conductor who's at the front of the train doesn't know there's a problem. But why did the train stop? It's a mystery the investigators now want to solve. They check the design for the train's hydraulic brake system and discover that it has a built-in fail-safe mechanism. If pressure drops, as in the case of a leak, the brakes automatically slam on, bringing the train to an emergency stop. Under normal conditions, it's a necessary safety feature. But now it only serves to trap the train in the tunnel, stranded 600 meters from help. Investigators know that a leak from the hydraulic system causing a 20% loss in pressure would trigger the automatic stop. That leaves more than enough highly flammable fluid on board to create the deadly inferno. Burning parts of the heater casing now drop onto the plastic floor, igniting pools of oil. Four minutes to go. Toxic choking smoke enters the crowded lower passenger car, followed by flames as the pressurized hydraulic oil gushes out, feeding the blaze. Now some passengers make their escape bid. The man next to me had to use extreme force just to make a hole in the window. Three minutes to go. At last the guard notices the flames coming from the back of the train. He alerts the control room and the operator tells him to open the doors and let the people out. 
then the intercom goes dead. In fact, there's a massive power cut. All over the mountain, cable cars stop. Ski lifts grind to a halt. Automatic doors at the top station fail. It's no coincidence. Investigators find that the fire is to blame. The blaze burned through a vital 16 kilovolt cable that runs alongside the track and through the tunnel, short-circuiting the entire mountain area. With so many dead, everyone wants to know, did the train attendant ever have a chance to open the passenger doors? Their question is answered by a gruesome clue. The investigation established that ultimately the doors were opened because the bodies of all the passengers were found outside the train. Investigators deduce that the attendant used the train's manual override and onboard battery power and did open the doors. But out of the 161 passengers on board, only a dozen ever made it out of the tunnel to safety. It's a mystery. What did those 12 survivors do differently from the 149 who perished in the flames? Now the train attendant opens the doors by using the manual override switch, freeing all the remaining passengers from the blazing coaches. But investigators know that all these people, 149 of them, perish. The question everyone wants answered, why do some escape when others die in the tunnel? What's more, many are fit, able-bodied men and women, some of them ski champions but not one makes it more than 142 meters. Investigators find the body of the German Olympic skier Sandra Schmidt 62 meters from the burnt out train. Japanese athlete Tomohisha Sase made it the furthest of anyone. They discover his body 142 meters away. But most people have fallen within the first 15 meters of the train. What investigators need to know is, how did 12 survivors cover more than 600 meters to get to safety when most perished no fewer than a few steps from the train? To find out, the team studies other severe tunnel blazes from around the world. They find the answer to the mystery in the design of the Capron Tunnel. It's built at a steep angle of almost 30 degrees. It means that when the blaze broke out, it would not behave like a normal tunnel fire. Dr. Richard Bettis has studied tunnel fires for 17 years and knows this is a major problem. Well, the important thing about a fire in a tunnel is that the, uh, the heat and smoke have got nowhere to go. Smoke and heat will rise up to the roof and spread out in both directions. But if the tunnel's uh, inclined, all the smoke will go upwards. And the direction the smoke travels is critical to the passengers escaping from the train through the now open doors. They face a crucial decision, which way to go? Downwards, on a steep stairway, towards the heat and smoke of the fire. Or upwards, away from the inferno. Just 12 decide to run downwards. The remaining 150 people all go up towards what they believe is safety. But that's the direction in which the heat and smoke travel in a tunnel that's now a giant chimney. Stan Ames, a fire scientist, knows they didn't stand a chance. Fire is always counterintuitive. It doesn't do what people expect it to do. And what these people did in taking the decision to move upwards was to move up with the smoke, with the toxic gases and the heat, up towards a certain death. And investigators discover that most people made it no further than 15 meters from the train. Not because of the searing heat of the blaze, but because of deadly chemicals in the smoke. 
The most dangerous component of smoke is carbon monoxide. And when you inhale carbon monoxide, it enters your bloodstream and the haemoglobin in your blood attaches to it, preventing you from using that blood to carry oxygen. Now investigators want to know why the 12 survivors decided to descend. The reason? They were led by a firefighter, Torsten Gredler. I shouted, run towards the bottom. The rules of how to act in smoke-filled environments have become second nature to me. As a volunteer fireman for more than 25 years, Torsten knows that to have a chance of survival, they have to get below the smoke. As he and his fellow passengers scramble out, he shouts to them to go down. But one passenger, Hermann Geyer, doesn't hear Torsten and runs the wrong way, uphill. Suddenly I heard one of my fellow passengers. It was Torsten, shouting, run downhill everybody. And that was my salvation. But as the Twelve made their way down the tunnel, the disaster was far from over. The Inferno was about to claim more lives, some of them people who weren't even on the train. Most people would think the further you are away from the fire, the safer you would be. But in this case, the smoke and toxic gases generated from the fire travelled the entire length of the tunnel and endangered the lives of the people in the restaurant and the station two and a half kilometres away. This is like being attacked by a fire on the other side of town. As the fire sucks in air from the bottom of the tunnel, it causes a massive updraft which propels smoke upwards at 144 kilometers per hour. The deadly cloud also engulfs the sister train, choking the attendant and his only passenger to death. It then pours out of the top of the tunnel, killing three more people in the station building. It's a terrible tragedy that the investigation team wants to prevent happening again. They want to know if it could have been avoided. But when they examine the train's safety specifications, what they unearth will shock the whole of Austria. As investigators scan the fatally flawed mountain train's design, they're shocked to find it lacks even basic safety features. The train has no smoke detectors. Its two fire extinguishers are out of passengers' reach in the sealed attendant's cabs. There's no way for passengers to contact the attendant and no emergency brake switch. Why are there so few safety features? In the hundred years since funiculars were put into operation, no fire has ever occurred inside a coach. This meant that there was a perception that a fire like this could never happen. Incredibly, investigators find the train does comply with safety rules. But the rules themselves are hopelessly outdated. They don't take account of new systems fitted when the train was modernized. Hydraulic braking systems and onboard electric power were two new innovations that severely increased the risk of fire. But the most serious blunder that the operators committed was to fit a totally unsuitable fan heater inside the control unit of the attendant's cab. As a result, 16 individuals are charged with negligence and indirectly causing the deaths of 155 people. On June the 19th, 2002, the case goes to trial. In their defense, they claim that they had taken the necessary precautions and the fire could not have been foreseen. Controversially, in February 2004, they're all acquitted after the court finds that there's insufficient evidence against them. The victims' families are devastated. In the wake of the disaster at Caprun, 
safety regulations on similar mountain trains have been toughened up throughout the Alps. This train system in the nearby Pitztal region is the same type as in Caprun, but boasts many new features, like video links to the attendant. Passengers can get cell phone reception in the tunnel. There's an intercom system, emergency door handles, and hammers to break windows. Now it all seems so obvious. Torsten Gredler was recognized as a hero for helping to smash a train window and leading 11 people to safety. But surviving the disaster when so many died, including 20 members of his ski club, weighs heavily. When I walk down the street, I have to go past two or three houses where I know they lost a daughter. Here the husband was killed and the daughter too. That's not easy to cope with. Many of the survivors have found the courage to return to the ski slopes. I still go skiing. To begin with, I found it difficult. I'll never travel in one of those funiculars again. While I'm at work, I've got something to occupy my mind, but at night, the memories come back. The mountain train at Capron was a disaster waiting to happen. One day in November, it took a simple malfunction in a domestic fan heater to set off a catastrophic chain of events. The faulty fan overheated and ignited 120 liters of hydraulic oil. That sparked an inferno in the passenger coaches that sent smoke billowing two and a half kilometers up the mountain tunnel and caused the deaths of 155 people. Now a new fast cable car has been built to take skiers up to the slopes. Tourists have returned to take advantage of the exceptional year-round conditions offered by the magnificent Kitsteinhorn Glacier. Slowly but surely, the town is rebuilding its image. But the mountain train at Caprun has never reopened.